Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to us, wherever we're joining us from. Um, it's a pleasure to have us today for another exciting uh, experience, uh, time with uh, our speakers, our panel of experts, as we'll be discussing regional integration in Africa, looking at how youth can leapfrog using regional integration. Um, first and foremost, I would like to um, introduce my co-host, uh, Ms. Fauza Abdi, and then delving right into our uh, issue for today. Uh, before we do that, uh, there are a few housekeeping rules, uh, which I would like us to also know. Uh, as you can see, the slide is up. Um, let's ensure that we remain mute at all times. Uh, we remain mute at all times. Uh, we also must ensure that our cameras are off. Um, if you have a question or comment, kindly type that in the Q and A box. And then for those who are those who are called upon to ask their questions, um, you will be asked to unmute yourself, and then you can eventually ask um, your questions. If you have, for those who intend to listen in in, in French uh, or other languages, kindly uh, select your language of your preferred language of interpretation, which is available. Um, to you. Before we, before I introduce uh, the speakers for today, we have a poll which we earlier conducted on on Twitter, and interestingly, the, the results are quite amazing and ast astonishing. Um, we'd like to ask you a few questions to ascertain your understanding or your understanding of what or how the youth can leverage regional integration in Africa to achieve uh, their, their goals on the continent. So you have the questions right before you. Uh, the first one says, do you agree that regional integration is going to impact Africa positively? Uh, you have your options right there to select. The second one basically is that, do you believe that regional integration in Africa can offer better opportunities for the youth? Kindly respond. I would like to have your responses as we proceed uh, with this uh, amazing event. Just as you are selecting your answers, I'll quickly introduce the speakers for today's session. We have with us um, Dr. Francis Mangini. Dr. Francis is the head of trade promotion and programs at the ASFTA Secretariat, that is the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. We also have with us uh, Nicolette Bulliani. Nicolette is the founder of Working the African Journey. Uh, we also have with us Claire Foley. Claire is the manager of regional integration department for Africa and the Middle East and North Africa at the World Bank. And finally, we have with us Dasidi Nidu. Dasidi is a postdoctoral researcher in poultry science, regional center of, of excellence in poultry science at the University of Lumen, Togo. And uh, you may find the profile of our speakers uh, at the event website, which will be posted uh, in the chat box. Now, the first question to our speakers is that, you know, for several decades, actually since independence years, African countries have been co have com have made commitments to regional integration, um, given the challenges um, in time past. Now, when we look at what the AFCFT has, has, has or aimed to achieve, you know, aim to achieve a more stronger, a stronger um, continent economically in terms of regional integration, looking at how it can impact the continent, especially at the youth population. Now, when we look at it, how do you think, or in what way do you think the youth can leverage the opportunities, uh, the opportunities provided by uh, the various agreements, especially in achieving regional integration? I would like uh, Dr. Francis to go first. Uh, followed by Nicolette, Claire, and then the city. Dr. Francis, over to you, please. Yes. Hi there. Hi. Yeah. So first of all, I'd like to highly commend you, uh, the World Bank, and all the partnerships uh, that have uh, enabled this event uh, to take place. And thank you for involving us as well as the African Continental Free Trade Area. The answer to your question is go for it. We have got what we can call the might of the youth, the demographic might of the youth. Uh, Africa is young, uh, the median age is just 19.7 uh, years. More than 70% of Africans are youth. 
So this demographic might must, must be brought to uh, bear on the equation. Now, secondly, what does youth stand for? Youth stands for ideas, for energy, for that burning desire to change the world, to live it as a better place. I think many young people, if you ask them, will tell you that they believe that after they have lived, the world's problems will have been solved. The world will be a much better place. And this is the inspiration which down the years has always resulted in improvement in the condition of the human being, in the, in the living conditions uh, of the people. So what we can say therefore is to appeal to our young people to deploy themselves, to continue the struggle that our four parents started way before the 1960s through independence to now. The challenge to the generation now, to the current generation, is to make Africa one single market where there's free movement of goods and services and people where Africa can realize its potential. We are talking about a $3.4 trillion economy. This makes it the fifth largest economy in the whole world. So this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to make this dream come true of having a single market that is large enough to catalyze critical levels of investment for dreams to be converted into businesses, for dreams to be converted into actual commercializable businesses, ideas to be commercialized, and young people are the best uh, to rise to the occasion. So this is what I can say to our people, to our Thank young you people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis. Um, I'll let uh, Nicolette, your thoughts on this, please. Okay, so um, I think um, our departure point is we have seen how um, unifying the continent has worked for our um, our four leaders or our former presidents and all um, in the era of um, independence. How they are coming together to work with each other has um, brought political freedom as well as economic uh, boost in the um, in the in the in the continent. So I think as young people, we can actually learn from from all of this and then look at how um we can open up to new markets i mean if there's a competition here in south africa of goods or services that are um actually you know that are actually flooded you can then go out to uganda or to kenya and actually start a whole new market so opening of new markets and also access um access and exposure to opportunities that could be out there else in, elsewhere in Africa that are not where we, we currently are. You know, the different countries have different um, economic um, finan and financial um, legal laws, I would say. And so going out there, you might find it's a bit well relaxed in the East or in the West, where you can already start your business um, and all of that. So there's opportunity elsewhere in Africa that might not be in where we are um, geographically. And politically, um, like I said, the big word is the is union or unity. Politically, we learn from each other. We become one front as young people. And I, and I guess most of us have um, things that we want or dreams that we have for the continent that are similar to each other. And us unifying each other means we are um, a larger force to enforce this to happen so i think you know we should leverage this union and the potential that it can have for us um economically politically and socially thank you nicolette claire your thoughts on this please thank you so much everyone and and let me just say what a what a pleasure it is to be on this um on this panel uh, in this event um Look, I mean, you know, the, the African Union, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, economists around the world agree Africa's youth are the continent's biggest and most important resource. Um, so, so how do we leverage regional integration? I think first, it's just to continue playing a very active uh, role and being an active member in the conversation around regional integration and how the AFCFTA will will evolve and will be implemented. Um, your voice really matters. You see things from a different and important perspective. Um, you, you have fresh new ideas. And with the reach of social media today, you're actually extremely connected, um, no matter where you are. 
no matter where you are um, across the continent. Um, I think the second way to leverage regional integration is to really pursue um, opportunities for um, additional education, skilling, um, and, uh, uh, and vocational training. And so that could be you know, a PhD for some people, but it could also be finding ways to access the newest uh, uh, technology or the newest research that's emerging about a really productive um, uh, strain of seed, for example. And the World Bank is doing a lot of work to support uh, productivity research around agriculture, given that it's such an important sector. You know, so any sort of opportunity uh, for those common sectors that are um, that are going to be so important for Africa's sustained growth, I think is is really um, going to be uh, an avenue to look at. And finally, I would just say, you know, let's continue to look at regional value chains. Um, the the World Bank's regional integration, uh, you know, portfolio really prioritizes looking at subregions, looking at regional value chains, because we think that with innovation that the youth bring, those can really be drivers for job creation and for economic growth. Back to you, Chuck. Thanks. Thank you, Sidney. Um, Sidney, your thought on this, please. The CD. The CD, vous avez la connexion? Okay. While we wait for the CD to respond to the first question, I'd like to um, welcome um, Fauzia to continue with the questions. Thank you, Fauzia. Uh, thank you so much, Chooks, and thank you, Dr. Francis, Nicolette, and Claire, on highlighting how youth can leverage the opportunity presented by regional integration. To highlight some few points, uh, these are the following. Continue to play an active role in the conversation, pursue opportunities, and continue looking to regional value chains. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Nicolette Mutuku, Nicolette Mutuku, as an entrepreneur, what sectors are viable for cross-border transactions? And also as a founder of Working the African Journey, which is a youth development organization, we are, we are interested in hearing from you on some examples of regional integration of challenges and uh, successes faced by youth. Over to you, Nicolette. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so just um, the first 30 seconds, I'll just introduce um, what the Walking African Journey is. It's just an organization where we do youth development, but mainly what we focus on is access to opportunity, um, regional integration, as well as stimulation of um, stimulation of the mind, we we actually stimulate our young people to start seeing beyond what they know or what they're comfortable with. Um, so yeah, so also since we are mostly we are in nine countries in um, in, in Africa, the the thing the challenges I'll start with the challenges that we have seen is fear of sovereignty in countries. So people think if we have regional integration, their own sovereignty is going to be taken away. They're going to have, there's, you know, there's that uncertainty of foreign people coming to their land to do business and them um, being scared of people taking their own opportunities when those countries are already um, struggling. So also, you know, we, we, we have tried to, um, we have tried to, like I said, stimulate their minds and help them see, um, opportunities uh, that would bring um, that other people coming into their space um, would bring for them. And then um, another second challenge that we have seen is development gaps. So where um, in another country, there is um, the oui. fourth um, industrial oh, okay. revolution, for IR, where there's four IR, you go into another country and you actually realize they have more uh, uh, bigger problems like food security so so much that um 
so much that introducing 4IR um, is not viable in that country. So, you know, you have to look at things that um, are viable for, for, for that community. So we had to then go and get groundwork so we understand that environment in that country. So we actually then give value to the young people in, in that area. And um, and then last year, it's, it's barriers to, to port and customs. So there's certain countries in Africa where still, you know, visas are still an issue coming um, and going. So that also just puts off young people, you know, that process of trying to get, um, trying to get into another country and all of that. So, you know, other young people miss out, um, miss out on that. So I would say those are the challenges that we have, we have faced. And then going into the industries that, um, going into the industries that would be um, good or viable for cross-border i would say recycling recycling because we were trying to look at productive industry and manufacturing that actually helps and is relevant for communities that are within um, our countries so for example you would see that metals that are not used in zambia anymore are viable for construction in lubumbashi dr congo or in malawi so you know we were just challenging young people um, and showing them how it's done on recycling things that might not work in that country but might be well appreciated and cheaper for for another country so that's the kind of um business that we were looking at which is um recycling tourism hospitality and culture exchange is a very important um industry because i think africa on its own is a very very um rich continent when it comes to culture but we need to be able to leverage um tourism and hospitality and sell it as a culture as well because i think our african holidays are really made for the european market and we need to actually you know customize them so it's a it's a so that it's a whole um experience for people that come and also just to make it interesting um and affordable mostly for african people um you know to choose African destinations compared to other destinations so that we boost um, the economy. So we've tried to, you know, um, put up packages of um, tourism uh, destinations in Africa for young people to experience Africa and different cultures and just appreciate um, the continent. And then um, pharmaceuticals, I find that so many people shy away from this because they think you have to be a doctor or, um, or study to do that. But it's a simple case of saying if malaria is dominant in Ghana and malaria is dominant in a part of Zimbabwe or, or, or Tanzania, it's a matter of you know connecting with people in, um, in that other country and see how they do it, what the best drug is, you know, procure it and you know, just share ideas on how it's done. So I think also pharmaceuticals and medical equipment which is very very important in Africa given the state of our health facilities um, of our government's facilities so I think um, it's all about them venturing into all these things and seeing how it's done in South Africa and how they can emulate that to do that in their own countries so I think um, it's moving away from what they are comfortable with to actually problem solving um, using skills and resources that they can find in other African countries um, yeah, so I think also the success is just quickly as I close off the successes as well um, is I've seen um, popping up of many uh, of many virtual groups of young people connecting from different African um, African countries where people share ideas, people actually connect and exchange goods and services via these groups, just like Yalda, I've seen AAFL, I've seen the World Youth Summit, young people meet on a global and virtual world now um, and actually exchange ideas and actually become clients um, um, and service providers of each other via that. So I think it's one of the successes that we have um, done on virtual that we actually need to move now from virtual actually to implement it on the ground. So yeah, so that has been my experience with regards to that. Thank you so much, Nicolette, for that wonderful intervention. Um, can we go over to Dasidi now? So Dasidi, just a quick one. Um, kindly keep it very short. Um, in what ways do you think the youth can leverage the opportunities presented by regional integration in Africa? Over to you, Dasidi. First, I want to thank you and actually start by uh, an example. In the outskirts of uh, a small town in West Africa, in a country in West Africa, there is an unpaved road that is uh, 
not really used during the day. But at night, what we see is that there are very large trucks that bring goods uh, from different neighboring countries to actually bring that to the market. And this transportation is not controlled at all by the customs. And the products that are being sold are uh, answer the needs of the consumer and actually allow for thousands of people to earn a living. And those are young people. And you can see that you have the same type of examples in the major majority of African uh, countries. So this is a precursor sign that shows uh, how integration, how regional integration is extremely important. You also have to consider that the success of uh, regional integration can only be done if the youth is at the center of any type of process for integration, because in regional integration also offers opportunities about exchanges of people and goods. And so what we also see is that it is important for African country to widen the regional markets because those regional markets will open opportunities to the you to the young people not only in terms of trade and business but also in terms of jobs so it is important for african country to actually widen their market furthermore uh, the african countries will need to ally their efforts in terms of transborder infrastructure for transportation, energy, and, and communication. And I want to finish by saying, I want to conclude by saying that we're going to need for these countries to emphasize collaboration in terms of policies, or in terms of labor policies, job policies, and this would be able to open up a lot more opportunities to the youth. And that's how um, Africa will be able to develop and grow harmoniously. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tassidi, for that amazing uh, intervention. Um, to our teaming audience, kindly um, put your questions. If you have any questions at all, you can direct your question to any of the speakers using the Q&A box. Um, you can also send uh, your questions to the chat box as well. Um, I would like to move over to Claire now. Claire. Um, the World Bank is one of the key partners to Africa's regional integration. Um, given that many, given many decades, World Bank has partnered with Africa, um, and we see that current portfolio you oversee is quite huge, is large. Please tell us a bit about your overall program and how the youth, you know, can take advantage of the programs you have for Africa. Thank you so much. Um, indeed, so the World Bank has been a very proud partner um, of uh, Africa's uh, uh, journey uh, towards regional integration, so over many, many years. Um, and, and the work we do is fully aligned and informed by the continent's you know, key priorities. So our counterparts are always going to be um, setting the agenda uh, in terms of priorities. We do currently manage uh, today in my department um, about 75 projects. These are across the continent, um, including North Africa. Um, and let me give you a few examples of some of these that I think are particularly important uh, uh, to youth. Um, the first, uh, we have a, a, an important program um, uh, targeting the youth skills development, and this is called the Africa Centers of Excellence, the ACE program. Um, we have more than 70 centers across 55 universities and 20 countries in Africa that are really, really targeting, um, providing uh, training and education in uh, uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math sectors, and really avoiding, uh, you know, the phenomenon of a brain drain out of Africa. We want to keep the youth um, uh, 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 within Africa and contributing. Um, and so this, uh, this ACE program has been extremely important um, in providing postgraduate access in fields with a focus on STEM and with a very high priority given to ensuring access to women in particular in science fields. So this has been uh, a program where we've had thousands and thousands of students across Africa gather at these various centers and complete um, their, their degrees and their qualifications. 
Second, we're working very, very much on the agenda of um, regional uh, digital connectivity and connectivity through transport in order to increase trade. Um, as my uh, colleague uh, panelist Dasidi just mentioned, it's absolutely critical to have increased and improved connectivity between the major countries so that trade can flow um, uh, uh, more efficiently. It's also extremely, extremely important in today's very highly connected world that um, there be improved access to energy and then really to the internet because that will facilitate online learning. It'll facilitate online banking. It'll facilitate um, you know, online business. Uh, so, so, so that is um, a second area of, of emphasis. Um, third, I wanna say that we uh, lay very strong priority on uh, supporting women and girls, empowering women and girls. Um, uh, the Sahel Women's Empowerment and Development Program is one that um, is mentioned frequently as I think a good example of supporting access to women and girls to quality education, to health services, and to training opportunities for livelihood support um, and business development. And there have been some really interesting um, you know, examples that have come out of how far uh, you know, a, a young woman can go if she's just given those essential skills and training that she needs and then the business is just off and running. Um, our work though not, is not only focused on you know, investing in um, hard infrastructure. We also uh, have a lot of programs that um, emphasize um, coordination uh, among uh, various countries for policies, um, supporting dialogue among them um, to, to, really, to really be able to boost trade and regional and support regional value chains. Um, so there's a, a recent program that was, uh, that was recently approved around energy trade in West Africa, um, where uh, six of the largest uh, energy traders there, you know, have agreed to um, essentially trade amongst themselves so that countries that have extra supply can then offload that to those countries that have demand and it avoids you having to go off and build your own um, your own power plant or your own set of infrastructure so these trades among uh, countries are extremely important and, and an, an important part of the regional agenda finally i just want to say that while we work across africa we really also try to prioritize those areas that um, we sometimes call hot spots they are areas that um, have been uh, subjected uh, to cross-border fragility and conflict. Um, and these include places like the Sahel region, Lake Chad, uh, the Horn of Africa, and the Great Lakes region. And, you know, I am someone who grew up in a country affected by conflict, albeit in the Middle East. And so, you know, I know firsthand how innovative and how resilient the youth that live in fragile and conflict affected regions are and how important it is to crowd them into the discussion around you know solutions that will be sustainable um, for those regions in particular so i'll stop there for now but happy to take questions on this thank you thank you so much uh, claire for that amazing uh, intervention i'd like to call on fauzia to take the next question thank you Uh, thank you so much, Claire, for the amazing insights on how youth can fit into such important programs. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Francis. Dr. Francis, as a member of the African Continental uh, Free Trade Area Secretariat, what can you tell us about young African entrepreneurs who move from one country to another to establish business or employment opportunity? And what does uh, the AFC FTA offer and how does it protect them? Over to you, Dr. Francis. All right, thank you so much, Fauzia. Um, so I, I usually don't like being prescriptive, you know, telling people that do the X, Y, Z, because I believe that uh, young people are smart. They know what to do. In the life of every young person, there is a dream. 
there's an idea which can be commercialized. There's a leader who used to say, let a thousand flowers flourish or bloom. And this is how the world gets enriched with the new ideas, with unheard of products, but which come in handy and result in advances in the arts and the sciences. So, so my stance is that uh, we need young people who are motivated, who are go-getters, who have got the life skills. So that's the first point I'd like to say to make for you. Then the second point I'd like to make is that we now live in the fourth industrial revolution. I think it was a, uh, Nicolette, the, our very vibrant young sister, who was making this point. So we need digital platforms. Now is a time when you don't need to physically move from point X to Y in order to achieve what you want, in order to trade. You just operate from where you are digitally across Africa, across the whole world. In fact, what the African continent of free trade area seeks to be is a digital African continent of free trade area, a digital AFCFTA. So that using digital platforms, young people and all economic operators can be enabled with online markets, with all the logistics that are required to con conduct their trade, with all the infrastructural services that are required for them to conduct their trade, and with all the market intelligence tools, so that from wherever you are, you can simply use these market intelligence tools uh, to find out trade and investment opportunities across Africa and indeed across the world and pursue them. So now let me give you an example of a trade, uh, a market intelligence uh, uh, tool that we have at the African continent of free trade area. It's called the Africa Trade Observatory. And the URL or the link is ato.africa, right? So you can actually even check it out just now. This tool, you can search for market opportunities for any product that you want to trade. And there are, you, there are about maybe 6,000 products in the world that you may wish to trade, as well as services that you may wish to supply. So you can use this tool to do a search and find out where markets are, where investment opportunities are, where there is demand for your products, and how much demand there is for your products. And if you encounter barriers, because you're saying that sometimes there can be barriers when you try to reach out to markets, you can again use another digital tool. It's called tradebarriers.africa. Again, this one, you can just check it out right now. So using this tool, you can report any obstacle challenge that you are facing in trying to trade across Africa. And then once you lodge in this complaint, it will be triggered across Africa, all relevant focal points who will step in to help address this challenge that you are having. So, we, so in other words, to summarize it, we have got everything in place for young people to pursue their dreams, to commercialize their business ideas so that the world can become a better place. But I have seen also one of the suggestions in the chat boxes is that we shouldn't only think about trade and investment in trying to improve the world or in terms of opportunities for young people. We should also try to think about protecting our climate. Because if we don't have a, a, a good climate, a sustainable climate, we shall not be there. There's no other planet Earth. So there are immense opportunities in protecting the climate, whether it's the circular economy, whether it's in terms of energy, clean energy, renewable energy, all these are immense opportunities. There are also opportunities in ensuring that there's peace and stability in Africa and across the whole world. So diplomacy is also a very important avenue for young people to contribute in making the world a better place. Cyber security. Of course, we know that under the fourth industrial revolution, now cyber security is a big issue when people can run, ravage you know, whole economies just at the click of a button. So we need smart young people also to protect our economies digitally and look into cyber security issues. So Fauzia, this is what I can say for now, but please, I encourage our young people to be the Africans we want. You know, we are trying to build the Africa we want under Agenda 2063. And this Africa is integrated, peaceful, prosperous, and internationally effective. So to build this Africa we want, we need the Africans we want. We need the people. So the youth need to be the Africans that we want in order to help us achieve this Africa we want, which would be the dream of our continent. 
So back over to you, Fauzia. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for the insightful topic. And also, I want to agree on uh, the point that you said, let a thousand flowers bloom, because the youth have the energy and the determination. And also, these are some of the digital uh, tools you can use to market opportunities for your product, like uh, ato.africa, tradebarriers.africa. Uh, to our esteemed audiences, uh, you can uh, ask your questions in the Q&A box section down below. And also you can share your views on regional integration and how it can help the youth. Next, uh, we're going to have Claire. Uh, Claire, young people in Africa uh, often establish small business with the aim of taking advantage of regional integration but they face many challenges, including in the area of access to markets beyond their borders. Can you kindly give us an insight on how your programs um, do help and what options are available for the, youth, for the young entrepreneurs to engage in cross-border business or intra-regional intra trade? Over to you, Claire. Thank you so much. Um, I think that that's a, a really important question. So, you know, I think that um, the World Bank engages uh, on on many different levels. Um, the first is at the national level, where it's a country dialogue on what the needs are of that individual country and its citizens um, in order to uh, create jobs, right? Because that's that's really the the ultimate um, the ultimate goal here is is job creation and, and economic uh, development. Um, and so there will be a series of programs that are run at the national level that involve, for example, access to SME, um, access to finance, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, access to digital skills. And for those, I would really encourage everyone to go to the World Bank website. We have, um, I think, a very, very strong and good policy on data availability. Um, by just, you know, looking at the country page that you're interested in, you will see every single project that is there. Um, each one of them has a team leader listed, you know, and it describes what's being done. The World Bank places extremely, extremely high priority and focus on consultations that are meaningful and that are sustained throughout implementation. So I think that you'll find um, that there are frequent opportunities for everyone, but we really love when we hear from the youth, from women, to give feedback. When a project is being prepared, give feedback. We watch that very closely to ensure that the feedback is being actually heard and that it's being used to inform potentially a redesign of the operation. That is completely fine. We'd actually welcome that. It's a sign that the consultations are working. Throughout implementation, there are additional, um, uh, you know, continuous opportunities. So I would say that would be kind of your first stop if you're interested in looking at what the national uh, level projects are. Our department, the Regional Integration Department, works with countries as clusters, as well as with the regional economic com communities, the, the commissions um, across the subregions. And so our projects, as I mentioned, tend to focus a lot on, you know, what are those, um, what are those common uh, uh, investments that really an individual country can't really make on its own um, in a sustainable way. But if, if a few of them band together, it becomes much more productive. Again, here, we're going to have a lot of consultations. Um, these are all publicly advertised. Uh, you know, we just have large departments that follow this particular aspect because it is so important. So I really urge you to take advantage of, of um, making your voice heard. Um, we have programs that are looking at, like I said, you know, access to education. I see quite a bit of interest in the chat box on the ACE program. Um, again, go online. I just checked it. Uh, you know, they have live uh, websites that um, that explain uh, procedures for access. 
um, and and all the contact names of the teams that lead this. It's a it's it's a it's a flagship program that we're really proud of, and which we want to bring more and more people into. Um, we also uh, look at uh, opportunities for um, young people to access what the research and development is is uh, coming out with across various sectors. Um, so I think that you know by um, uh, using the World Bank website, we want it to be a tool that's accessible to everyone. It shouldn't uh, it shouldn't um, feel like a one way source of information. Um, I think would be would be would be a very good way to start. Um, we're open to feedback. We want to hear ideas. Um, the uh, the regional integration uh, strategy, you know, has recently been updated. We held a series of consultations, um, and they were extremely extremely useful. There are also then milestones that come up throughout the year. So, um, you know, the uh, the Yalda group, you're already, you know, very closely in touch with the World Bank. I would really suggest, you know, take advantage of the annual and spring meetings. What we found um, the during the annual meetings this past fall, they were conducted virtually for the first time ever. And it was an, a wonderful opportunity to just gather so many more people around the virtual table and hear so many, so many more voices um, than would have been possible before. So those will be coming up. And, and I think that that would be another another opportunity uh, for for engagement and and to, to provide your stories. Thank you so much, Claire, for that um, wonderful update. Um, I'd like to quickly move to Dasidi now. Um, Dasidi, just a quick one. I would like you to receive your answer to a minute, a oui. minute or, or less, if possible, because of time. Okay, given that the youth are the future of the continent and uh, investing in their skill development is key um, to the continent's economic transformation. And looking at a more integrated Africa, in what ways can we ensure that these skills um, meet the needs and transitional requirements um, of the continent? In other words, how can we shift from informal skills acquisition to a more formalized process uh, with certifications and the likes? Over to you, Dacidi. Merci. Uh, suis, uh, Thank you. Uh, we have a bit of technical difficulties, I'm sorry. In order to succeed in the uh, regional integration, Africa must uh, focus on skills development in the engineering, but also in sciences. And also our universities need to review their curriculum for training. So uh, their training programs but also to offer trainings that will be aligned on the labor market. So for an integrated Africa, we'll need to focus on regional specialization and training so that we can have the benefit for the young people. And this is where youth can implement their business skills and have jobs. This is what most African countries are trying to do through the excellent centers of excellence that are within universities that offer trainings that are very specific trainings. For instance, technology, we have numeric, we have development, that these are a few items. For Togo, for instance, we have a regional aviary specialization in with a master's program and doctor's program, but these PhD program, but these are for aviary sciences. So they focus on the improvement of aviary and poultry development and agriculture development, but also improving the sub products in this sector. So to illustrate the importance of these centers of excellence for the development of skills, 
I would like to give you the example of my country, Chad, where most of people do consume eggs, but they come from Cameroon. Thus, this is one of the obstacles and challenges. This is why I chose the poultry center in order to take up this challenge. Besides the centers of excellence, CERSA, there are also other centers of excellence. There are more than 70 of them that offer training very uh, performing uh, trainings in very in various area. For example, the electricity with uh, life expectancy on mathematics, as well as other different areas such as digitization, uh, digitalization of, of Africa. Okay, so I think there is also an opportunity that uh, is offered by those centers. I'm talking about the opportunity in terms of a skilled network. Those uh, centers of excellence are a skills network, but also allow for young people to get in touch with different nationalities. And there is a mixing of everybody. So, and from there, there is a very robust network that is created. So today I'm in contact with people from Benin, Togo, Nigeria. I also have friends uh, who come from the Gambia, from the uh, Côte d'Ivoire and Nigeria. So what we do is that once in a while we exchange on different topics. So I think that those centers of excellences are very relevant. They have a very important role to play in the development of skills and I also want to congratulate the World Bank that has actually helped with those centers. So today, those centers are part of the regional integration. So I wanted to conclude by saying that this integration has to promote the mobility of human resources. And that's a very important point. In Africa, we see that there is an inequity in terms of development and growth. And so mobility of resources, of human resources, will be very important to bring an equilibrium and a balance in the development of Africa. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dasidi, for that um, wonderful intervention. Um, please, uh, to our esteemed um, audience of participants, kindly you keep your questions coming in. Uh, we will try as much as possible to answer the ones uh, we could, uh, given the limited time we have. Um, now to the Q&A, hey, I have a couple of questions here. I would like to direct the first one to Dr. Francis. Um, this is coming from Dr. Sadiq, who is delay from um, Somalia. He says, uh, given the current threat of COVID-19 to our continent, how can the African youth in science and medicine leverage the AFCFTA um, to advance the continent's research in health and human services? And um, that's to Dr. Francis. Our next right. Question, oh, thank you. Um, can yeah, I, thank you. Be, be, before you answer that, Dr. Francis, let me quickly get out the question so that we can take um, take everything at, at, the, at the go because of our time. Um, so the next question uh, is from Sedik. Um, Sedik is from Cameroon. Uh, he says, we all know that regional integration will promote better development in Africa, but countries harbor, but countries continue to harbor protectionism. I will direct this to clear. Um, it is also important to work with the political barriers which reduce the efforts made in the direction of integration. So uh, this question goes to Claire. So Claire, how is the World Bank um, working with African countries to ensure that we do not harbor protectionism? Um, and foster regional integration. And the last please, uh, another question which we have here um, basically goes to, okay, I think I'll allow Dr. Francis and Claire have a go at the questions and then we can come back to address other questions. So Dr. Francis, over to you, please. Right, thank you, Jukes. 
Now, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the colleague who has asked uh, that very important uh, question. And uh, I would like to answer it by saying that uh, the education in the science, technology, biology, engineering, and mathematics is extremely important, but this should be coupled with the training in management skills, in business management skills, in entrepreneurship skills. Because even if you have all these uh, products that you invent, if you don't have any uh, ways of commercializing them, then they, uh, they remain on the shelves uh, permanently forever. So we, so we need this, the training to be comprehensive in order to enable our population, especially our young people, to translate their inventions, their ideas, after they have appropriately been trained into practical products that can be of use on the market and for the people. Now, this means, therefore, and I wanted to build on what uh, our colleague was speaking just a moment ago, that our training, our education must ab adopt the entrepreneurial approach. This means that uh, at our universities, vocational training institutions, secondary education, high school, even primary school, our students, our kids should always do research, do coursework, do their homework with a view to commercializing those ideas, with a view to coming up with a bankable project so that you graduate, not just with a certificate, a paper, but also with a business, with a project, a bankable project, which you can use to start a business. Now, this mean, means also that this entrepreneurial education requires that our universities, our think tanks, our research institutions, our vocational training institutions should establish organic partnerships with the industry where students can do attachments during a training and with the banks where credit lines or financing lines can already be explored, where feasibility studies can be done and presented for funding. So this is the first point I wanted to make. Now to round that off, uh, we actually have a practical example of how we can tackle COVID using, uh, we can tackle COVID. If you check the Africa medical supplies uh, platform, amsp.africa, you will see that more than 200 million worth of transactions have been transacted on this platform for providing uh, medical facilities, including medicine, therapeutics, diagnostics across, across Africa virtually. You simply upload the product that you want to sell and you will receive an order and then you can supply it, uh, you, of course, using courier services. So this is an initiative which shows you that uh, we can actually tackle COVID through inventions on the continent, whether it's in the area of detergents, sanitizers, but as well as medicines, uh, therapeutics and so on and so forth, and actually sell them across the continent using a digital track platform, amsp.africa. So this is what I can say in response to uh, uh, that question. But I think it's not just limited to the pharmaceutical sector into which we need the investment actually, uh, it also applies to all other sectors, whether it's agriculture, whether it's energy, whether it's manufacturing, light manufacturing, heavy manufacturing, retail, services such as banking services, communication services, transport services, across the board. As I said earlier, I don't want to be prescriptive. If you allow people to think, they will come up with solutions to problems, uh, every problem literally that you have, so that we continue as humankind advancing the sciences and the arts. Uh, back to you, Jukes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fuase. So, uh, Claire, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think that that this that the, the question on protectionism is extremely relevant. Um, so, first, I think let me let me lay out how uh, a World Bank regional integration project is financed. Um, and, and so the, the way that it's financed is that um, the countries uh, finance a certain portion of the cost, but then the regional window, there's a regional window, this was a fund that was established in order to um, support uh, regional integration programs, the regional window puts in up to two thirds of the total cost of the project. Um, as long as there are at least three countries that are participating and there is a demonstrable regional impact that can be measured. <clears throat> uh, 
and that we we know will will uh, come out as a as a development um, uh, uh, outcome of the operation, and so it's therefore extremely important that any sort of um, initiative that is being uh, proposed um, is going to have to be win win, right? Everyone involved needs to um, uh, have uh, an incentive, an economic incentive, often to to participate. And this tends to work very well when the incentives and when the demands are aligned. So, for example, in the West Africa Power Pool, this was a uh, you know an organization established by ECOWAS, and the World Bank has supported the West Africa Power Pool for the past ten years. Um, in West Africa, there the, the we are financing thousands and thousands of kilometers of transmission lines and electricity distribution centers so that the countries of West Africa um, can uh, trade energy amongst each other in a way that is finally beneficial to them. Uh, it becomes cheaper for them to just have access to a grid that they can pull power from, as opposed to, as I had mentioned earlier, building a whole new um, power plant uh, uh, for themselves. Um, and so, the way these operations are designed is that they're very, very deeply rooted around very thorough economic analysis. There are then, you know, agreements among the countries that are signed um, at the highest level, um, and and then they're financed, right? So there are all these these um, uh, layers in place to really ensure that all the parties to this agreement are going to are going to be in a win-win situation. I think another example is uh, the investments that we have currently in the transport sector in the Horn of Africa. So we have uh, projects there that are connecting, you know, Kenya, Djibouti, and Ethiopia. These are still under preparation. Again, here we know that there is demand because there are, again, detailed studies that are undertaken, detailed consultations with people who, like my colleague Dasiti mentioned, um, are on those roads every single day. And if only the one-stop border post were better, if only the procedures to cross in and out of borders um, were more efficient and were easier, we know that people would trade there more and would use those routes much more. And so again, it's a win-win. Um, and so it's, it's a very important premise, I think, when we're looking at um, operations that the countries themselves propose, right? They come to uh, the World Bank and and uh, there's a demand for these operations. Um, there needs to be the fundamental, you know, alignment of needs, alignment of incentives, and then uh, our teams work very, very closely with counterparts to to mobilize all the various instruments. They can be legal, they can be financial, they can just be pure, you know, coordination using the RECs to really have that sub-regional dialogue and coordination on, on what's needed. Um, and then that usually dramatically increases the uh, rate of success of, of a regional operation. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Claire, for that amazing um, response. Um, right now, we'd like to call on uh, Marshall. Um, I understand Marshall has a question for the panelists. Masha, if you can hear me, kindly unmute to ask your question. Okay, we may have to proceed. Um, Asha, can you hear me? If you can hear me, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, while we wait for Masha to unmute, um, I'd like to ask uh, this question from Bryce Hadiu. Um, Bryce says that, uh, that isn't it valuable to rethink content of multilateral agreements regarding investment, labor market, and even diplomacy? Um, so he wants to know, or the person wants to know um how we can rethink the content of multilateral agreements um, as it relates to investment labor market and even diplomacy i would like to ask uh, i would like to ask this question to the city 
Um, Dasidi, can you answer this question, please? Merci. Thank you. Uh, je remercie votre, uh, Thank you. Thank you to the person who asked the question. So when we talk about regional integration, you have to say that it is really a whole thing. You will have mobility for human resources, which means that when a young person is trained in Togo, he or she might be free to go to Benin to work. So regional integration takes into account all these factors. As I said earlier, a process for this regional integration has to include all young people. They have to be at the core of all these processes. So, so we're talking about infrastructure. First of all, we have transportation. It is a means that will enable young people to be included. And you have the development of skills and we have to focus on that. And then all the countries have to together, work together, cooperate for all this. Now for training or we should have a universal program, a program that would be regional. Only if only on training, you see that in agronomy, which is my field, you'll see in the University of Lome, you have molecular biology that is taught. But if a student were to leave Burkina Faso, and they do not know this topic, and they come to Togo, they should be able to get into this field, but he will be told, no, you didn't go into molecular biology, you don't know it. So they have to go back to this field in order to get a trade. So we have to have a uniform training for specialization. So agriculture, let's take agriculture. Poultry, if you want to start, you will talk Benin and take Benin and Togo. We're in the same area from the climate point of view. And thus, we should have training that would be focused more on the same milieu. This is what we're talking of when regional integration in the region, it should be uniform as to training. And this would be excellent training. That's why the centers of excellence funded by the World Bank do perform impeccable work. And this is already a site that is for regional integration to summarize the states, the governments have to group themselves in order to, to really put together their efforts for education, health, transportation, and many other fields. And that's where we will be able to talk about mobility with the labor that will be qualified and thus qualified human capital. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dasidi, for that amazing intervention. I would like to call Mando to ask um, his question. Menlo John Duna. Menlo John Duna, if you can hear us, can be on mute and ask your question. Thank you. Hello? Yes, you can Hello? proceed, John. We can hear you. Uh, 
Exato. It appears um, we lost John. So I'd like to call on Ashe to ask his question. Ashe, are you, are you there with us? Or Wilson there? You seem to have a fantastic question in the Q&A. Wilson, can you hear us? Um, it appears we... Um, it appears that we do not have a live. Um, we do not have uh, questions for the for for our live session today. Okay, I think definitely uh, for all the questions that we have, we, we would we would send our response to them in in a subsequent uh, conversation, subsequent follow up emails. Um, just like we, we said when we started, this is the first in the series of conversation. That we'll be having on how uh, the World Bank is, um, is is fostering regional integration, especially how it impacts um, Africa's teaming youth population. Uh, we want to appreciate the panelists. Uh, before we close for today, uh, I would like to invite the panelists to give us um, closing remarks in less than thirty seconds. I would like to call on Nicolette first. Nicolette, can you give us a closing remark in less than thirty seconds, if possible? Thank you. About you, Nicolette, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to the panelists that we, uh, the panelists that um, were here as well as the attendees. So, just quickly, I think um, for um, for the young people in Africa, I think the um, continental trade free area is the right um, regional integration system or program that is up for us. It's then up to us to actually stand up and start doing um, something about it, to leverage off all of this. I would say research and get all the information that you can get, because I guess knowledge is power, but also this equips you with the right tools, the right information on how you can actually uh, make use of this. Start researching about other countries that actually have your interest in terms of business culture, um, um, or, or social aspects that you might be interested in. And also research on, um, on organization and institutes like the World Bank that will actually help you and in, um, into integrate or make your dreams um, a reality in as far as development um, is concerned. And lastly, I would say, you know, one person success in Africa um, in turn gets into the other person and, next, uh, and the next. It's a ripple effect for us to actually develop our, our continent. So yeah, I would say for young people, let's actually leverage this opportunity and do what it takes to develop the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicolette. Um, Dasidi, over to you, please. Your closing remark in less than 30 seconds, if possible. Thank you. OK, I would like to Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers of this roundtable that is very beneficial for Africa. I believe personally that this was very interesting to me. I will remain very open to other roundtables and I also want to seize the opportunity to thank the World Bank that has always helped the youth, in particular for training and for excellence. Uh, good evening or good day. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dasidi. I would like to call Dr. Francis for his closing remark as well. Dr. Francis, over to you, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Chooks, and thanks to the World Bank for this event. So my message to our young people of Africa is this. Let us build the Africa we want under Agenda 2063. But to do so, please be the African that we want. Own it. Use it. Let it work for you. So that's my first message. Second message, believe in yourself. In you, you have everything that you need. Have the confidence to pursue your dreams, to turn your ideas into projects, into business, and earn all the money that you can in the world. And then, and then thirdly, and finally, we need a universal Africa. As an African, you're part of, of humankind, the human family. Nobody should be left behind. So let us work together as humankind to tackle the problems that confront us as humankind, climate change, peace and security, including cyber security. Let us all make this world a better place. And you, the youth, always have the energy, the new ideas to contribute to advancements in the sciences and the arts. So please go for it. Those of us who work at the African continent of free trade area, we are there for you. We are there to serve you. Just give us a call, send us an email, and we shall be able to help you. And I'm so happy to have heard what uh, our young people are thinking. They're all very energetic, very vibrant, and also to hear what the World Bank is doing uh, to help turn things around. Thank you so much. Back over to you, Chooks. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis. It's been an amazing um, event. Uh, before I call on Claire to give us his closing remark, I would like to remind us that after this event, we'll be taking a very quick poll to understand how young people's perceptions are as it relates to regional integration and what you've gained by joining um, today's webinar. So I'd like to call on Claire to give us uh, his clo our closing remarks. Over to you, Claire. Thank you so much. I, I, I really, really enjoyed this session. I learned a lot. I, um, I would like to uh, thank my uh, fellow panelists for, um, you know, for inviting me onto this. It's the main message that I think I'd like to leave our participants with is that we want to hear from you. You have, you have the fresh ideas, you have the um, uh, the spirit and the innovation, you have the knowledge of, of what needs to happen. So we want to hear from you. Please do reach out, um, uh, use the World Bank website, use the, the resources that are there. Um, and and I think just just know that the, the World Bank uh, truly, truly um, wants to hear from you and wants to encourage the counterparts to make sure that your ideas are crowded into the solutions as we move forward. Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure and an honor. Um, I want to appreciate our panelists for an amazing time. I think we can have the poll now. Uh, the poll basically wants to know what you've gained by joining today's session so that we can also facilitate further conversations as it relates to how the World Bank can assist every African, every young African in its regional integration efforts. Can we have the poll now, please? Okay, so we have uh, the poll questions uh, basically asking, uh, do you believe that regional integration in Africa can offer better opportunities for the youth? Kindly feel free to tell us what you think. And um, uh, in terms of the questions earlier asked in the Q&A box, uh, unfortunately, due to our time, we are unable to answer all the questions. That notwithstanding, I will send further communications to us, which will also include responses to all of the questions. So while we wait for participants to take the poll, we would like to also specially thank uh, the Yada team, the YTA team, and of course the World Bank uh, Africa team who has worked uh, assiduously to ensure that this uh, webinar becomes a reality. Uh, it's been an amazing opportunity to work with everyone. Thank you so much, and we really appreciate what you've done in putting this event together. I believe and trust that certainly 
we'll have subsequent events where we'll discuss this. As you can see the result, everyone strongly believes that we have 69 percent. Um, 69% strongly believe that internal integration, you know, is key to achieving um, better opportunities for the African youth. So thank you so much. Uh, we, we appreciate you and definitely we'll keep in touch. Thank you and I have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.